Today's video is a story of what happens when uh, one person is technologically incompetent and one person is very technologically competent and gracious and uh, what can happen when we um, still are able to collaborate and put things together. So you'll notice today's video is a little bit chopped up. I have a Zoom call set up, forgot to press record and um, lost the interactive component of that, but thankfully my guest was recording on their end. And so um, you'll see a whole lot less of me. <laughs> and um, more of um, our guest who has a lot to say. Um, our guest is Ed Cross, also known as the Restoration Lawyer. He is the president of the law offices of Edward H. Cross and Associates. And for the last 25 years, has been advocating and litigating on behalf of restoration contractors. Um, most of you should be aware of what the RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, has been doing, and more specifically, Ed's work with the AGA Committee, the um, Advocacy and Government Affairs. And so it's been very encouraging to see the RIA pivot to focus on advocacy and how they have taken a step in the right direction to lead by example. Um, one of the things Mark has asked you know, in his document, our greatest need is for people to come together rather than being fragmented. And so um, RIA and IICRC have done that. Ed will talk about some of that and what came out of uh, the conference last year, uh, two organizations aligning to better represent um, restoration contractors and focus in their fields of um, expertise uh, to collaborate. And so the same is being asked of contractors. There are so many things that need to be fixed in our industry under the leadership of the RIA and the committees with the third party administrators, third party consultants, and then the pricing. Um, those are the focuses for this year and moving forward to try to gain momentum there. And there's some exciting things that Ed will talk about and that uh, anyone can look up um, you know, on the RA website or see the, the updates there. So Ed shares a lot more of uh, his story and how he got into law. And um, you know, if you're excited about what Ed has been doing and the, the momentum of the AGA, uh, it sounds like we owe a debt of gratitude to Alice Cooper. Um, so we'll get into that story right now. Okay, so you were uh, at a point in your career, uh, you were lean and mean and rocking and, and uh, you auditioned for Alice Cooper? I did, yeah. As the drummer? Yes. Okay, so how long have you been drumming then? 46 years. Do you still, you still tinker or are you still uh, active? I, I don't play out professionally anymore. I have my big grand finale uh, back in May of last year. I had a big show. I played uh, a legal parody of the rock opera Tommy by The Who, wow. and I knew I'd never be able to top it again, so I decided that would be my last uh, professional performance. Star? Yeah, I tried. So, I tried. So if Alice Cooper had called and 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 um, said yes, then we we may never be where we are. Right now. Well, yeah, you know, the, and... the guy who got that gig uh, played for Alice Cooper for a bunch of years, uh, and then afterwards got hired to join a band called Kiss. And his oh. name is Eric Singer, and he's on tour with Kiss right now to this day. And oh, so geez. who knows? I might have ended up in Kiss. <laughs> Wow, that's, probably not. Uh, that's pretty wild. Yeah, it was so. Um, and and from what you were saying, you, you thought you had the gig, right? And then it was an agonizing two weeks of, <laughs> of waiting by the phone. Yeah, I was really ready uh, for yeah. that audition, and yeah. um, they wouldn't say what songs we were going to play. They said we're just going to wing it, and oh, so wow. we ended up playing "Schools Out" and "Under My Wheels" and "Poison." 
and I, I really, I really thrashed those drums. And like Alice asked me afterwards if I, I broke the guy's snare drum. And I said, oh, wow. well, this isn't a jazz band. And he laughed. I made Alice Cooper laugh. And so that was worth uh, going over there just for that. And then I, I walked out. The manager pulled me aside. He says, you know, I think you got this gig. I was pretty excited, to say the yeah. least. And I went home and stared at the phone for two weeks, waiting for it to ring. <laughs> Oh, man. So w- was joining the legal field on your radar at that time, or were you planning to go full-fledged rock star? You know, uh, when I was in the fourth grade, one time I was standing out on the playground, and I had a picture in my mind of what it would be like to stand in front of a jury and speak to a jury. And I saw myself in a light gray suit uh, talking to 12 people and trying to convince them of something. I don't know what. And, um, you know, I always wanted to try to pursue something huge. And I've been on stage since I was a little kid, first as a drummer, and now uh, doing this. And, um, you know, people say, wow, that's a radical transition going from rock and roll to law. And in a way, it's really not. You know, we're getting up in front of people and uh, trying to make an impact, trying to get a reaction out of them. And there's all different ways to do it, and it's not just uh, with one particular haircut. One thing I didn't want to do is get involved in personal injury law, and as luck would have it, when I was clerking during law school, the only law firm that would hire me was a personal injury firm. And I ended up learning the mechanics of how those cases work. So once I became a lawyer and I got a mold case, I knew how to put together medical records for an insurance company to look at and how to present a PI claim. And it actually uh, served me well. Became valuable. Yeah. So that was, you said um, that you were uh, involved in one of the first, it was a sewage loss that went to mold and- and Right. and you were involved in suing the contractor on the behest of the homeowner, correct? I was, yeah. Were you in construction law or real estate law, or how did that uh, how did that even come about? I was not on any law. Um, I was okay. a brand new admittee, and uh, the law firms were not hiring when I got out of law school. There weren't okay. any jobs. Uh, so I had my own job at that point, my own little company. I was editing law books for law students. And I decided to continue doing that and just see what would happen. And one day I discovered that down the street from my office was the Orange County Bar Association Lawyers Referral Service. And I went in and signed up and they referred to me a legal malpractice case. And the guy said that he had a sewage loss in his house and his lawyer didn't do anything about it and he wanted to sue the lawyer. Well, it turns out there wasn't really much of a claim against the lawyer, but I said, I'd like to handle the property damage part. And that's how it got started. Wow. wow. Do you, what year was that? The sewage flood was on Cinco de Mayo, May 5th of 1995. And oh, wow. uh, I okay. got onto the case uh, a few months after that. And it was really, really my first uh, referral as a lawyer. And huh. um, there were uh, issues with the sufficiency of the cleaning there and sure. the remediation, and we brought in Peter Stierk's company, Environmental Testing and Technology, and I started to learn about indoor air quality. Um, yep. About two months before Cinco de Mayo, the house had appraised on a refinance for $80,000, and the recovery that we got in the case was $688,000. It turned out wow. to be one of California's first big mold cases. And then wow. that led to a surge of referrals coming into my office from hygienists and from occupational health physicians because they were needing lawyers to help some of these people out. And in a very short period of time, I had over 150 mold cases uh, under my roof and uh, had a dozen employees. And we were uh, knocking around on those uh, pretty heavily through the 1990s. Uh, And around 1996, uh, some restorers invited me to come and speak for the Carpet and Fabric Care Institute in Southern California. They said, come to our convention and give a presentation as to what we need to do so that you won't sue us. Okay. And so I did, and they started offering me work, and I felt much more comfortable working in that uh, environment. Having grown up in the construction business, I just think I'm better suited to work with companies as opposed to consumers. Yeah. 
Well, it's a small world. My first AMRT course um, was with Peter Sirk. Oh, yes. I think that was like 2002 or something like that. So, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. He's, he's a great mentor, yeah. uh, an incredible uh, asset to the yeah. entire industry. And I was fortunate enough to uh, work with him and Rachel Adams and some of the other experts on uh, developing the exam you took for the AMRT. And I, oh, wow. uh, I wrote the legal part of that. So you've got very me to cool. thank. Yeah, he, I, I remember he was uh, very knowledgeable and very in-depth, but also helped break it down so it was usable right. information. Well, yeah. he, he's got that good, yeah. uh, straightforward German logic that he follows. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, he's a very, well, sometimes very good teacher. Well, sometimes what happens, though, is especially when you've been doing it a long time, you, you kind of like the sound of your own voice. And right. it's more about you know, the bravado than actually helping people right. trying to do it, right? So yeah. that's, that's interesting. Yeah, um, great guy. And you know, in the late 90s, the insurance companies <laughs> stopped paying out any kind of real money on mold-related illness cases. So that was yeah. kind of the handwriting on the wall. And I got very lucky with the timing on that. I happened to be in the right place at the right time and managed to settle a whole bunch of those uh, cases when it was really lucrative. Yeah, and yeah. then I and then I got at. I mean, it got to the point where there was nothing you could show the insurance companies where they would pay. And I went to a mediation on what I thought was the strongest mold-related illness case I'd ever seen or had. I mean, we really, really dotted all the I's and crossed all the yeah. T's. And the insurance company said, "We're sorry, we do not pay on mold-related illness claims." Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of bogus ones had been filed. And so yeah. it ruined it for those who had the good cases to the point where the insurance company says, we don't care what you say, we're not going to pay any money for that. Yeah. We ended yeah. up settling that case, by the way. They, they, they put in an extra category of money in the settlement, kind of undefined, you know, I've got this yeah. for property damage and then just some extra money. But, but their, uh, their policy was they don't pay on illness claims. Yeah. Well, that was, I mean, my start was we had a... a a mold remediation division at a local service master that was a new thing and um, insurance companies were still paying on the um, I think what was the structural Ed McMahon was one of the big ones right? it was and yeah that everybody refers to that was a big case so it was still a time when people when the insurance companies were paying and figuring out how to I guess not pay right <laughs> uh-huh so the first class and got very interested in the science end of it um, and I ended up earning a certification as an indoor air quality professional from AEE. And then I went on to uh, take the WRT class and I earned okay. a certification as a, a WRT. And I didn't, uh, I didn't maintain those certifications because I wasn't using them. Uh, but, sure. but back when I held myself out as an indoor environmental lawyer, it was nice okay. to have those credentials. Yeah. And then uh, yeah. later on, I was uh, honored to have been invited to participate in the uh, drafting and writing of the IICRC's water damage and mold standards. And oh, wow. uh, that was a very, very illuminating experience for me to be able to be in the room with so many experts, uh, listening to them uh, debate those issues. And you hear the arguments from both sides and made me much better equipped to litigate the cases later. Because I, yeah. you know, I had this unlimited source of uh, the expert opinion, which normally you'd pay a couple hundred bucks an hour for. Here it's, yeah. just, you know, it's just flooding in for free. It's, it's wonderful. It's very rewarding. Yeah. So you were um, working on the S500 and the 520 then? Yeah, very deeply on the 520. And I uh, handled the, uh, the legal committee there, and I was also on the main committee. For the viewers who haven't seen it yet, there's an excellent interview that Michelle Blevins did uh, with you. It talks a little bit about your background and how you get started, and I enjoyed watching that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, are you litigating with restorers nationwide or still focusing mostly in California? Or It's all over the country, and yeah. um, I'm currently licensed in California and Hawaii. I will soon be licensed in New York and North Carolina. For the states where I'm not licensed, I work in conjunction with a local lawyer because each state wants to have one of its own licensees on each case. So sure, sure. I work on a consulting basis to uh, lawyers outside of California and Hawaii and uh, basically co-counsel cases with them. So a, a local liar, lawyer might take the case and then you come in. I heard that. Next. That was a Freudian slip there. 
<laughs> I don't think I said liar. I said light lawyer. <laughs> Sounded like a Jim Carrey movie to me. But anyway, go on. Yeah. It, the pen is blue. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'd have uh, several dozen speaking engagements uh, for RIA and taught yeah. webinars for them. I was a columnist for them, published a bunch of articles. And uh, they were always very supportive of me, and I was very grateful to them uh, for that. And then... Um, Last year, in uh, early 2019, I was uh, approached about running the RIA's advocacy group. And um, frankly, I was a little skeptical about it. And like most associations that are uh, nearly three quarters of a century old, the yeah. RIA has had its blemishes. It's had its stumbles along the way. Um, but what I heard... Uh, when Mark Springer contacted me about this was a brand new, fresh, and innovative idea by RIA to kind of rebrand itself, not just as an educational group, but also as an advocacy group. And I was well aware of the different problems that restorers were facing uh, yeah. and that they were getting worse. There are some very strong pro-consumer laws here that were not written with the emergency service uh, contractor in mind. Mark explained to me how much horsepower and energy the RIA was willing to put into this, and I came to see that RIA is a very different organization now. Um, there's yeah. fresh, young, new leadership there, and they're really thinking outside of the box, and they're staying very focused on specific objectives. And there are so many issues that restores face. I mean, it's a very complex yeah. business, legally, financially, uh, in terms of regulations, all the litigation. And um, so what they've done now is they've, they've zeroed in on some key um, points that they want to focus on. And uh, they're very organized. And I just returned uh, a few weeks ago from the Board of Directors Strategic Planning Session at Association Headquarters in yeah. New Jersey and was absolutely delighted to hear how much enthusiasm the Board of Directors has for the advocacy initiative and uh, how much energy the new management company, Association Headquarters, and the CEO, Christy Cohen, are putting into it. And they're really, really um, working hard and making some yeah. very smart decisions and they've got a huge team of people and uh, there's there's a group for social media there's a group for uh, print publications there's a, there's a very yeah. strong group uh, to build membership and I mean there's there's an army of people there and I'm, yeah. I'm very optimistic about what's going to be accomplished um, we had an impact in 2019 that was a big boost on morale and we can talk a little bit about that um, RIA is very much an education organization. Sure. IICRC is a standards writing and certification organization. The people at RIA put in a tremendous amount of effort and uh, intellectual horsepower into working on a fire damage standard. Well, uh, in the meantime, uh, IICRC uh, had plans to do a fire damage standard as well. And you could imagine the problems it would create in the marketplace if there were two different uh, sure. standards for fire damage restoration. And so, yeah. you know, RIA and IICRC um, are a great match for each other. They complement right. each other and they're not competitors. And so by virtue of uh, the mutual benefit agreement, which was signed in a live signing ceremony at our annual convention last year in Phoenix. Um, RIA is now uh, focused on education and advocacy, and the IICRC is focused on standards writing and certification. And IICRC um, has a new president uh, who's coming on board, and he is quite interested and quite well-versed in advocacy himself. And we're oh. looking forward to, uh, to working with him and uh, we plan to be in lockstep with IICRC all the way going forward, and it's a good match. It was meant to be. Yeah, two two giants in the industry, right? You know, working together. Yeah. Um, I think you had said uh, out of that outflow um, 
of the AGA really identified three key areas, the TPAs, the TPCs, and then pricing. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what TPAs, the third-party administrators, and then the TPCs, uh, the third-party consultants, and then pricing kind of speaks for itself. Right. Um, can you talk to how did those conversations come about as far as um, solidifying those three areas and then the, the position paper, which I understand is the first for the RIA, correct? Right. Yeah, it is. So um, first, as kind of an overarching statement, the RIA seeks a unified voice for the restoration contractor. And what I experienced and what many people experienced is that the industry was very fragmented. Um, yeah. Everybody was facing a similar set of problems, but they were approaching them in different ways. And the uh, other stakeholders were sometimes dividing and conquering. And the classic example is when an adjuster or a third party building consultant uh, shows up on a job or looks at an invoice and tells the contractor, you know what? Your competitor down the street is not charging for this. Or your competitor down yeah. the street is not doing it this way. And what we're doing is we are sharing information between the contractors to figure out what they are actually doing and coming up with position papers that say that. So when an adjuster or a consultant comes along and says, well, the guy down the street isn't doing it this way, right. or this is not standard or usual and customary, you could say, um, excuse me, sir, but... Um, here or ma'am, here is what we have um, from the Restoration Industry Association. This is a peer-reviewed uh, position of our industry as a whole. And this yeah. is one of the tangible, one of many tangible benefits that restorers are going to get uh, from the, uh, the AGA, which is position papers. There's no need yeah. for you to reinvent the wheel every time uh, you get hit was some sort of argument or some sort of challenge uh, from an adjuster yeah. or a third-party consultant. What we're doing is we're formulating the arguments that you can use, that you can present. It's going to be ready for you, and yeah. you can copy and paste this into emails, and you can use this stuff um, to help make sure that the, that the playing field is, is really leveled for restoration yeah. contractors, both legally and financially. So the mission of RIA is to educate, advocate, and elevate the restoration industry. Yeah. And so um, we are going to accomplish that uh, by involving the members and the major industry stakeholders in uh, the process that we're undertaking. Um, we have collected from them a list of issues they see as the biggest and most important challenges, yeah. all right? Then we pick out from those, the ones that appear to be the top priorities. We form subcommittees on those. The yeah. subcommittees are staffed with the leading experts in the country on those particular issues. They research the issues, they come up with positions, they prepare drafts of the positions, send them up to us in the AGA committee we comment on them, we revise them, we send them back to the subcommittee, we give them feedback. Uh, working in conjunction with the subcommittee, we reach a consensus as to what should be in the position paper. And then we send it up finally to the RIA Board of Directors and it doesn't get published until it has been approved on all three of those levels. So the restorer can have confidence in knowing that lots of different experts from lots of different parts of the country have looked at this. And um, then uh, the, another part of our objective to achieve the mission is to uh, broadly communicate our progress so that everybody understands the, um, the impact that the AGA is making on the industry. And uh, lastly, of course, we need to raise financial resources to fund this effort. It's a lot of time and there's a lot of uh, expenses that are involved with it. And the new management company is going to be a good steward of those resources. So uh, we went through that process and what the industry told us was that they were very concerned about um, the prices and standardized pricing platforms, that they were very concerned about some of the tactics of third-party administrators 
And lastly, that they were concerned about some of the, the tactics and things they saw as being unfair from third party consultants. And so we started calling them TPCs. TPCs include independent adjusters, they include bill reviewers, they include uh, any third party who is not the contractor, the restore, or the insurance company, somebody who's brought in from the outside. And naturally, we have to address those issues in a different way. It's a very different dynamic. When somebody's working for a TPA, they sign up for that. They do it voluntarily, yeah. but a right. TPC is thrust upon the restoration contractor against his or her will, and uh, that creates a different set of issues, as you can imagine. Yeah. Sorry that yeah. answer was so long. I received a flood of emails from all over the country from people saying, you know what, finally our voice is being heard, finally some things are, uh, are moving in yeah. the right direction, we're getting some things turned around here. Most notably, the senior leadership of RIA uh, met with um, Exact Wares President Mike Fulton, um, Exact Wares Vice President of Pricing Greg Pine, and uh, Bill Loveland, who, as I said, was one of the founders. And um, it's important for everybody to understand that Exact Ware has acknowledged that the price methodology needs some work. It needs to be uh, adjusted and yeah. you know prices were pretty static back in the day of the Great Recession but prices are much more dynamic now and there's some yeah. new things that need to be implemented to make sure that the pricing stays valid and current and up-to-date and yes we are looking for uh, certain trades in certain markets to get paid a higher price but the point of this is not just for contractors to get paid more money. The point of this is for contractors to get paid a fair price. And when we say right. fair, we don't just mean fair to the contractor. We mean fair to the customer and we mean fair to the insurance company as well. Because if it's not fair to everybody involved, it's not sustainable and it has right. to be sustainable. And what's happening right now with stagnant prices, uh, being used, uh, Xactimate being weaponized against restorers, uh, good restoration companies having to close their doors, TPAs having trouble with recruitment, um, and, and many other problems. It's not sustainable. And right. the public is going to suffer um, if uh, there is a major cat loss, for example, and... Um, the, some adjuster comes out and they try to uh, insist that the homeowner accept a settlement based on prices that are three years old. I mean, that doesn't yeah. work. You know, that affects consumers across the country. It impacts the whole economy. This issue is that big. It's that important. Yeah. And so um, we applaud and thank Exactware for the efforts that they have uh, shown several important initiatives that Exactware is working on with us. We're not here to pick a fight with Exactware. We're not here to pick a fight with the TPAs or with the insurance carriers. We respect yeah. the insurance carriers, but we want to make sure that this is sustainable and, and that this is fair. So what we are doing is we are focusing on coming up with real solutions. All right, we're not just wallowing in the problems. The set of issues is not going to get uh, resolved by um, a bunch of posts on Facebook. All right, it's going to take face to face meetings with the decision makers to help them understand that in the court of public opinion, uh, they might end up on the wrong side of this if they don't listen to what we have to say. Yeah. Restores, uh, contractors, by approximately 80,000 Xactimate licenses per year. All right, the restoration industry is roughly 50% of the Xactimate licenses that are out there. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a voice. It's a real voice and it's right. an important one. And they are listening to us, they are paying attention, and they are willing to implement some changes that we believe are gonna move this in the right direction. And we thank Xactware for that very much.
I think the Loveland thing kind of made a lot of people aware. I know that kind of made me aware that there was a shift happening, you know, in RIA and uh, it's an impact conversations with you. So, and and that is really uh, boosting restores morale, and yeah. uh, that's a positive impact. And you know, the last couple of years, restores have been coming into my office saying, "Oh my gosh, Ed, we're just getting beat up. The TPAs are yeah. beating us up," and you know. We, we sign up for a TPA program, you know, committing to a pretty modest price to begin with, but then they right. come back with 12 or 15 corrections, 20 corrections on an invoice yeah. where they're slashing out items. Yeah. And so we've got to fight to basically, we got to yeah. buy our check. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. um, it's, it's not a good situation. And, you know, there's responsibility on both sides. And after being a lawyer for 25 years, uh, I've I've learned that in every dispute um, there is some validity usually sure. to what somebody's saying on each side. Sometimes there's some misunderstandings, and there are some restorers there who are not uh, playing by the rules. Okay, we yeah. understand that. I'm not here saying oh restorers are perfect and all insurance companies are evil. That's not the point of this at all. The point yeah. of this is that uh, some adjustments need to be made on both sides. And we, uh, through the RIA's education arm, is uh, working with restorers to make sure that they're doing things the right way as well. Yeah. Yeah, and you got the homeowners too. I mean, they're, if, if they're caught in between a battle between the insurance companies and the restorers, they suffer, but they're not innocent in the, in the grander picture either. All right, so. that's true. <laughs> um, so as far as the uh, the approach of the RIA, um, the AGA was commit, or I guess the first kind of step is to commit wholeheartedly to an advocacy uh, platform right? Uh, as an association. And then the AGA was formed, and out of this came the vision that, at least for now, these are the three key areas to focus on. Um, and, and so there's subcommittees in there that represent uh, people that want to speak on into those areas or have experience. Like I said, you've gathered people from the industry that uh, are very experienced in not just understanding those areas, but winning some of those battles in a sustainable way. Right. Um, and then your role shifted from uh, a, a volunteer capacity leading the AGA to now what they call the, the restorer advocate, correct? Uh, it didn't shift. I got additional duties. So <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was and I remain the uh, chairman of the Advocacy and Government Affairs Committee. And hopefully we will be bringing on a new chair of that committee in the near future so that I can uh, focus more time and effort on my recent new job for RIA, which is as restoration contractor advocate. And so um, everybody should uh, go to restorationindustry.org and click on the advocacy menu there. And yeah. that will take you to the article called Our Greatest Need, which is a brilliant manifesto written by my friend and colleague, Mark Springer, who is who's truly one of the most enlightened and smart uh, people I've ever met in my life. And what he did there was he laid out the problems and then he laid out a specific seven step plan to yeah. address those problems. And one of them was uh, to form the committee. And one of them also was to hire an advocate. And the advocate, according to the plan, which I've named the blueprint, uh, is a non-contractor. You see, I'm not yeah. in a position where any of these companies can retaliate against me. I don't hold right. an Xactimate license, I don't do business with TPAs, and I never will, all right? Yeah. So I can go out and speak candidly with them without any concerns of retribution. And I was not involved in deciding who the advocate was going to be. I recused myself sure. uh, from those meetings that AGA had, 
AGA came up with a recommendation and then that went up to the board of directors. I wasn't party to any of those discussions either. And I got yeah. the call one day that said I had been selected as restoration contractor advocate. The role of the advocate is to go out and campaign for the positions adopted by the Restoration Industry Association following the research and analysis of the hardworking volunteers of the AGA and its subcommittees. Do I understand correctly that's a paid role as it well? It is, yeah. Yeah. But that, I mean, obviously that makes sense because, you know, as a contractor, there's things you want to say that you probably shouldn't and, uh, right. and defer to that uh, yeah. I guess, for lack of a better term, the higher power, right? So the, uh, <laughs> the representative power. So it's it's now a representative democracy. Um, Hope so. And uh, well, and I think it's interesting you alluded to uh, lobbying there in California, and then um, I know that's part of Mark's outline. He said, you know, long term, that's probably realistically something you know the RA needs to look into, and obviously that would require significant. Um, input of resources to be able right. to um, I don't want to say compete but in a lot of ways it is to compete at that level we're, we're playing from behind to some degree um, right um, and have you have there been more talks as to what that looks like you know uh, the engagement of lobbyists is the seventh step in the yeah. program and um, that is something that we uh, see out on the horizon, but we're staying focused right now on the immediate pressing needs, which is to address issues with Xactimate, with the TPAs, and the third-party consultants. Yeah. And uh, we're not gonna get spread too thin uh, dealing with too many different issues. Uh, there is one other thing uh, out there that people should be aware of, uh, there is a patent infringement lawsuit uh, pending in the Pacific Northwest. There is the holder of a patent that relates to uh, what I believe are some pretty ordinary drying techniques who has sued a company up there uh, for allegedly infringing on the patent. And uh, this is something that could grow into something important uh, that everybody should take a look at and although you don't hear AGA speaking publicly on uh, lots of different issues, rest assured that we are monitoring them and sure. um, that we will uh, be notifying everyone as soon as developments occur. There's a lot of confidential negotiations that are going on behind the yeah. scenes and we don't want to upset the apple cart right now by going out and you know naming names and saying, here's what we're working on. You know, yeah. we're, we're trying to foster a, a collaborative working relationship with these other stakeholders. And yeah. uh, it's going to take time. You know, if somebody's 50 pounds overweight, that didn't happen overnight, okay? Right. And, and losing 50 pounds won't happen overnight either. It took us a lot of years to get to this point, and it's gonna take yeah. us some time to get out of it. But frankly, things have accelerated and proceeded at a much faster pace here than I had anticipated. What conversations have you had with TPAs? Um, uh, like, is contractor connection part of that? Uh, that uh, obviously that triangle. Um, the TPA subcommittee produced the Restoration Industry Association's first ever position paper. Uh, you know, next year the association is going to be uh, seventy-five years old, and um, it's uh, it's pretty yeah. amazing everything that's happened over those years. Uh, but if you look back, you'll see that no position paper has ever been put out. Yeah. And the TPA subcommittee um, broke that glass ceiling, if you will. The uh, TPA subcommittee is also working on um, a scoring system, uh, compiling information from different restorers about their experiences working with TPAs. And I think it's gonna be a very uh, valuable uh, member benefit for a restorer to be able to kind of get a little bit of a review about a TPA before making the big commitment to go to work for one because it really changes the whole dynamic yeah. of yeah. a restorer's business. I mean, that's, that's a whole different kind of business model. Yeah. It's a high volume, lower profit uh, model and some are able to do it successfully and some crash and burn uh, in yeah. the process. 
So those are the two priority items for the TPA uh, subcommittee at this point. Uh, and then after that, uh, I look forward to reaching out, extending an olive branch, and having some productive uh, discussions with some of the bigger uh, TPAs. But we're not going to name names right now. Sure, sure. Is there anything you feel like we didn't um, quite touch on? <clears throat> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a perception problem in this industry. Things have become entirely too adversarial. Contractors report to me all the time that they feel like adjusters, TPAs, and TPCs are ripping them off. And what I've learned in my travels is that the TPCs and the uh, insurance companies feel like contractors are ripping them off, all right? So things have really decayed a lot. And all sides of this, all sides, need to work on uh, improving the way the other sides perceive them. And we need to find some ways of making this less adversarial. And the way that restorers can do it is to unify, to get together, to join the RIA, to throw their support behind the AGA, uh, and they're gonna see some tangible benefits from that. We need to change the dynamic. We need to change yeah. the, the tenor of things so it's not so adversarial because everybody suffers when it decays to that point. And so, you know, the, the vision of RIA is to be a unified voice for the restoration contractor. And we have strength in numbers. Many hands yeah. make light work. And we need as many people as possible to get on board for this. And we believe you're going to see a good return on your investment. I mean, if people think it's dark now, you know, it could be headed to a much darker place. So, um, right. I, I think, uh, like I said from our initial conversations, uh, it gives me a lot of hope, you know, that uh, I think it's very coherent and there's a, a structured approach to. And Mark breaks it down pretty pretty accurately, you know, and, and comes from the standpoint of I'm a restorer, been doing this for many many years, and uh, and uh, won some battles and lost some battles, right. you know. So uh, yeah, in the article "Our Greatest Need," which people can read on RestorationIndustry.org, Mark makes a pretty compelling argument that yep. if things continue the way they are, the restoration industry will be virtually unrecognizable. So many things will change uh, that it will really start to go sideways and everybody's going to suffer. And yeah. so uh, working together, we can keep that from happening. And I want to thank you, John, and uh, all of your affiliates uh, for their efforts in helping to get the word out and uh, help us achieve a fair and level playing field for restorers. Our thing is trying to develop intentionally, and um, you know, you you speak to that very well as far as uh, you know, uh, the restorer has to help tell the story of the loss on behalf of the homeowner with the insurance company, and work in the paradigm of exact mate those kinds of things, and then um, you know, like you said, uh, a fair and sustainable. You know, I think those are those are huge things. So. It's been um, it's been a nice beacon of hope, you know. Um, yeah. You do well in keeping people updated as much as you're able to on the details. Yeah. And, uh, so I encourage people to to read the article, check. You said the advocacy page, and then you're pretty active on social media as far as sharing your videos when you have something that uh, is shareable. So right. Uh, keep keep fighting the good fight, Ed. Thanks. You too. We appreciate your help. Yeah. Awesome. Tell Frank I said hello. Again, um, if you stuck with us through the video and my technological errors, uh, uh, a huge thanks to Ed for not only taking the time, um, but being gracious to help um, piece this uh, interview together and salvage the content. Um, Ed, uh, as you can see, is very passionate and very knowledgeable about what he does. Um, I, uh, some of the things that stuck out to me is those three things we talked about at the opening, you know, contractors coming together. Um, what, what comes to my mind is we almost every organization that we market to or work with, whether it's IFMA or BOMA or local school organizations and those kinds of things, they all have advocacy components to them and that's an essential part of what it means to be you know, an industry and an organization and combining our powers. And so, you know, we all know um, 
when we combine forces together and work together, uh, that uh, helps us get closer to our goal and gain more momentum. And so, um, you know, that's an interesting ap aspect with an industry that is built on people that are independent. You know, how, um, giving up a little bit of your independence to gain ground in what we all need um, for the greater good, you know, is an interesting um, component of what the AGA is doing and the RIA as a broader um, construct with uh, with advocating for contractors. I like Ed states in one of his updates that um, we need to be aggressive, uh, diplomatic, and ethical, you know, and, and like you talked about in the interview, we have to build something that's sustainable, um, you know, and unfortunately it's to the point now where it's not looking sustainable, and Mark mentioned that, mentions that in Our Greatest Need, and so we are all keenly aware, you know, that the industry that we um, uh, serve in and love and has built uh, careers for many of us and our families, um, you know, is uh, there's definitely some things that need to change in order to keep it that way, um, and, and, and in a lot of ways regain some of the ground that's been lost, and so... Uh, it's exciting to me. I think it gives us uh, hope that uh, it can be done. Um, and, you know, those kind of things kind of reverberate in my head, that collaboration component, much easier said than done, you know, especially when we're all very independent and then that aggressive, ethical, and um, diplomatic, you know. And so uh, sometimes we forget to combine all three when we're uh, um, setting up our approaches to things. And so it'll be very interesting to see how this progresses. Um, you know, uh, there's information. Ed's got the restorationlawyer.com. Um, the RIA website is full of information, their uh, magazine and the advocacy page, and uh, Ed's been very good about sharing updates on social media, and Restoration and Remediation Magazine has been, excuse me, posting most of those, and so um, there's just a, a wealth of information, and uh, the time is now for sure, so hope you enjoyed, thank you.